People say that access to birth control equals less abortions. Can you explain why you have seen that to not be true? Walk us through some of the harms of contraception that people need to know about. Contraception tends towards moving us towards using the other person as opposed to respecting the other person and seeking what is good for the other person. Sex doesn't become the only way of spending time and being intimate with each other. So women feel revered by their husbands and women revere their husbands. They get a special kind of God. Hey guys, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today we're talking to Dr. Janet Smith, who is a philosopher, moral theologian, PhD, a professor who has been working for decades and tackling questions about sexual ethics and contraception. Now in today's episode, we're going to break down the topic of contraception from a non-religious point of view about why and what the harms are of contraception. I think this topic is so important because today, birth control is being presented as a solution to people. It's something that's the safe or the smart thing to do. And even there's arguments saying that birth control will help reduce abortions, it'll make society better. We get into the details about why that is surprisingly often not the case and some of the other cultural myths about birth control. Please check out Dr. Smith's work. In fact, her work was really instrumental in opening my eyes over a decade ago. You can check out her work at the link in the bio. I hope you enjoy this episode as we break down the question of contraception, why not? Dr. Janet Smith, welcome to the podcast. Great to be with you, Lila. So first off, I love for people to learn more about you. I've been a fan and admirer of yours for almost 20 years. I think when I first learned about you, um, well, maybe 15 years, but I was in my late teens and I was very inspired by your work. I found it really life-changing actually. So I'm really excited to introduce you to the audience. For those that don't know you, you are a moral theologian, you're a philosopher, you're a PhD. Can you give some of your background and your, why you started to study sexuality, contraception, these issues with our audience? Yes, well, it's a, it's a long story, and I, it, it's it's worth hearing, but not only only have a short period of time. So I, I would tell you that my, my degree is actually in classical languages, Latin and Greek. Mm-hmm. But um, when I was a young person, it was when they were liberalizing the laws on abortion, and I got very interested in it and uh, held some of the first demonstrations ever outside of an abortion clinic in um, Iowa City in Iowa. And the more I did that over the years, I made a connection between contraception and abortion. All right. But I could see that contraception completely changed people's understanding of sexuality um, to the point where they were um, ready to have sex with individuals, men, women with men, and men with women with whom they had no intention of having a child. And so that when a pregnancy occurred, it was a disaster. And um, and hence, a great need for contraception. The fact that contraception that abortion was legalized not long after contraception became widely available is not an accident. There's actually kind of a causal effect there. There's many contributing factors, but this is a major factor. Mm-hmm. At the same, so I started looking into the question of contraception. I mentioned I'm a philosopher at the time, not a theologian, but at that time, not so much a moral theologian, but. I started looking into the Catholic Church's teaching on contraception. A number of my friends and I were becoming more faithful Catholics, and that was a major objection that people have. How can you be an intelligent person? How can you be a graduate student? How can you be a professor and accept the Church's teaching on contraception? So I started looking into it, and not just its teaching, but it, you know, of course, the reasons for the teachings. And people think that the Church sometimes just sits in a room and makes up something like, we have to prevent people from having pleasure, and so we, they have to have less sex. Um, so let's not let them use contraception. Um, it's not the way it works. It's really it, it's very experiential thing. Um, what sort of damage does contraception? What what benefits are there to contraception? What um, what damages are there from a contraceptive lifestyle? And as I worked on that, it became, the, I just learned so much about how contraception was really just horrible for women's bodies, for our psyches, for our relationships. Um, and it, 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 and as I tried to explain, and now we know how much it's, uh, damage it does to the environment and how many other uh, difficulties it leads to acceptance of, say, homosexuality and transgenderism. All these things are connected conceptually. And so I, I just became fascinated with it. There was almost nobody who was speaking about this. And so um, 
what one of my brother in laws once said to me when he heard how much I spoke, he said, Oh, gee, I'd like to be as successful as you are someday. And I said, Well, when you're the only person in town that's talking about this, you get a lot of invitations. So it wasn't there a lot of competition to beat out. So it's probably been almost um, maybe 35 years now that I've been uh, speaking on this wow. topic. And yeah, what I've learned and what people have told me based on their own experience uh, is remarkable. Well, I'm excited to break that down in this podcast. I promised our listeners they could count on this as a kind of an introduction or a primer to that question that you've asked in an amazing essay that you penned years ago, Contraception, Why Not? And not just this religious case for against contraception, like there's a bunch of religious fundamentalists who just want to, like you said, stop people from having fun and pleasure, but really from a practical perspective and a philosophical perspective about what is really the consequence of these different actions that we take as human beings or as adults. But I want to start with one thing that you said, which was very interesting. You said one of the things that got you to explore this topic of contraception was abortion, actually. And typically speaking, today, people say there's a narrative that says that abortion is actually reduced when contraception, when birth control is made more available. In fact, unfortunately, the Republican Party, the GOP, just plat just changed their platform to include that we need more birth control. When they talk about abortion, they say we're against, you know, late term abortion. So they've watered down the platform and they're saying people need more access to birth control. So this idea is access to birth control equals less abortions. Can you explain for starters, Dr. Smith, why you have seen that to not be true based on the research and based on common sense? Well, uh, if you, it, it's worth looking up for people, just look it up, look it up on the Internet. Uh, most of the time where you find a. A reduction of abortion because of contraception it has to do in a country where abortion has been the means of birth control, where people didn't have access to contraception. And so when they got married, I mean, cut pregnant when it was inconvenient, abortion was the solution. So if you introduce contraception into a culture in which there was no contraception, it may reduce for a period of time the, no the number of abortions. For instance, when I was looking at this many years ago, um, uh, the average woman in Russia would have eight abortions in her lifetime because it was the means of, of contraception. You introduce contraception, that will decline. And in a culture like, and not that it's, there's the other harms aren't there, the harms to a woman's body, the harms to relationships, et cetera, and, and possibly over time, <clears throat> excuse me, a kind of an increase in um, abortion because, again, it it facilitates relationships that are not receptive to a child. And so um, what happens in a cult, you can look at our culture, just look at the number of abortions throughout the, uh, the 20th century. And as contraception became more and more available, the number of abortions climbed and climbed and climbed. And it, it makes perfect sense. Um, just you could predict that because the major reason for um, centuries why women would not have sex outside of marriage and men. And just a little pause for a minute. Um, my father probably died about 10 or 15 years ago. And for his cohort, um, it, about 85% of them were virgins when they got married. 85%, right? Now, why weren't people having sex in all those decades when my dad grew up. He was born in 1921. Well, the reason was, a well, big reason, lots of reasons, lots of reasons. The, the, the culture didn't accept it. It didn't promote premarital sex. Um, there was not pornography everywhere. The entertainment world would glorify marriage and family much more than single relationships and promiscuity, etc. cetera. Um, and so people, that was the value. And they would not have sex before marriage. They would think that this was um, being not true to the person you're going to marry, that you are, um, uh, in a certain sense, defiling a gift that you're meant to give to the person that you marry, that I belong to you and you alone. And um, sex is for building a family. And I, I wouldn't want to risk anything before we get married. I wouldn't want to risk for a man. I wouldn't want to risk impregnating a woman having children that I'm not going to be in their lives for people. My father had a very high sense of duty 
he had a sense of his responsibility. So the, the thought of having a child out of wedlock for him would have been that he was a scoundrel in a sense, that he was not going to be there for, for the children that he, um, he had fathered. And so he tried to pass that on to my, to my brothers, the responsible male, um, all's in love with a woman that he wants to be with for the rest of his life. He can wait for her. He can do that. And the children they have will be within marriage. Well, you enter contraception into a scene and into the scene of the 1960s. I mean, the pill was basically invented late 1950s, early 1960s. And it, it just was an absolute um, bomb, if you will, explosion. It co combined with a rise in feminism that women were had no value unless we were in the workplace and competing with men. And so that if, if we were going to be having babies, we weren't going to be able to do that. So we needed to have contraception. Uh, fear that the world was greatly overpopulated and responsible human beings would have no children or very few children. Well, those, those were other pressures, but it made people think there's no reason not to have sex outside of marriage. Um, a pregnancy won't happen. Well, when I was in high school, um, it was in the uh, mid, late 1960s, and the whole sense was that certainly they were girls and, and, and boys were having sex out, uh, were having sex, but it was frowned upon. It was weird. It was like they're kind of um, rebellious. Uh, and it wasn't anybody thing talked about. It wasn't anything that, um, like, it didn't, people didn't aspire to having sex. I mean, a few, a few would. Most people thought, no, that's something to wait on. That's something to wait on someday. I mean, the idea of holding hands or kissing was just fantastic. The notion of having sex was just like, that's 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 for a later time. But you enter contraception to that picture. And honestly, for women, we thought we had no reason to say no. And the men thought we had no reason to say no. So just the pressure, the pressure. You couldn't say, what happens if I get pregnant? Um, you couldn't say that. They should all use a contraceptive or I'll use a contraceptive. And, um, I mean, studies do show that in the 60s, particularly when the pill was being introduced, there, there weren't that many uh, abortions. So it, it exploded once and uh, contraception became available. But if a, if a young man was pressuring a young woman to have sexual intercourse, um, she would say, well, what are you going to do if I get pregnant? And then he would say, well, of course, I'll marry you. Um, I love you. That's why I want to have sex with you. And a wise woman would say, well, then, of course, I'll have sex with you on our wedding. And uh, there were a lot of, uh, I taught, um, I was a, t a professor at Notre Dame in the, in the 80s. I had a lot of students who were the result of sexual intercourse outside of marriage. But their parents married each other, right? Because that's what you did in the 60s when a woman got pregnant. It, the man would be honorable and, and marry her. Um, I remember when I was in college in the early 70s, one of my friends was having sex with a, really, I thought maybe the handsomest guy on campus. And, and I was a little bit jealous and asking her, but what happens if you get pregnant? And she honestly said to me, I don't know him well enough to ask. And I thought, oh boy, what kind of world is this that we're now in? It was seen that that's a, a, an absolutely obvious and important question. If sexual intercourse is going to be engaged in, what happens if I get pregnant? How many women ask that these days? Mm -hmm. Afraid to ask it because they think if they do, he's gone. All right. And so, it, and it's, a, you know, in it, Likely the conversation goes somewhere like, whoa, 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 what? I thought you were taking precautions. I'll take precautions. Um, well, listen, if you get pregnant, I'll, I'm a decent guy. I'll pay for half the abortion. Or listen, I'm a really decent guy. I'll pay for the whole of the abortion. So you want to say, is this to the benefit of women? Is this to the benefit that, that contraception makes men think that every woman should be sexually available? Again, when I was a college student, before contraception became totally available, there was no such thing as date rape on campuses, all right? Where did date rape come from? I mean, guys think that every girl is taking contraception, and guys think that that means that every girl is sexually available. And his view wow. is sex with other guys. What's wrong with me? Why not me? All right? And if she's protesting, it's like, well, she doesn't really mean that. 
she's taking contraception. She can't really mean it. Sex is no big deal. That's what contraception has come to make us believe, that sex is no big deal. And I, I think that that's the thing, that, that it's so much behind all the um, sadness and difficulty of male-female relationships now, where sex used to be a huge deal, right? And it was a huge deal because it was a statement of a lifetime commitment. You did A responsible person did not have sex with another person unless you intended to be the lifetime per partner of that person. So saying, I want to have sex with you, was equivalent to saying, will you marry me? <laughs> okay? Because it was, you know, I, I love you, so let's get married and we'll have sex and we'll have babies and we'll have a life together forever. Now it's contraception. Well, you know, maybe we should move in. Maybe we won't. Maybe he'll be there in the morning. Maybe he won't. Um, maybe I'm just one of many. Maybe I'm someone special, but maybe I won't be special for long. And it's it, it's just it rendered human relationships, male-female relationships, absolutely without clarity. Once you start having sex with a person, all clarity goes out the window about the nature of this relationship. And you're just waiting to see, like, but is this really a real relationship? Are we going forward? When do we have those conversations? Are we going to marry each other? Hmm. Well, the sex is pretty good. We don't fight that much. And who wants to start all over again? And that's what I call sliding into marriage that many people are, are now doing. It's not as if you started dating with the intention of finding a good spouse. If you're dating with the intention of finding a good spouse, that means, among other things, a good father or a good mother or a few children. You have a whole different standard that if you just want to have, you know, a sexual partner or someone to go to parties with or someone to live with for a period of time, the standards are totally different. And if you make your standard, I, the woman I want, a man is thinking, is going to be the mother of my children. I want a totally different woman than just saying, I just can't wait to, um, you know, she's hot. I'm going to take her home and we're going to have sex. And who knows where we'll go from there, as opposed to saying, no, I'm, I'm looking for I'm looking for the, the mother of my children. Woman saying, wait, we tolerate all sorts of really bad behavior from men if we're not thinking of them as the father of our children. If we're going to think, I want a father of my children. I, I had a, a, a friend of mine who fell in love with her. She's a graduate student, good Catholic, gone off to graduate school, fell in love with this man. They were having sex. She was crazy about him, crazy. And uh, uh, then she she realized it was wrong, and she stopped having sex with him. They still had some sort of relationship on the phone all the time. I said, are you still in a relationship with him? She said, yeah, yeah, I am. I, I don't think over many men it fascinates me as much as he does. And I said, well, then why don't you marry him? And she said, well, he hates God, and he hates the Catholic Church. He doesn't believe in God, and he hates the Catholic Church. He said, I, I want to marry a man that I can raise my children with inside the church. And I said, could, would you write that down like somewhere between 25 and 100 times and then just see what kind of conclusion <laughs> you want to draw from that? I mean, he had spent like five years in a relationship with this. Did you know that you can start saving lives with your morning coffee? Do you like to drink coffee? I like to drink coffee. If you drink coffee, you need to check out sevenweekscoffee.com. Seven Weeks Coffee is named after the fact that at seven weeks old in utero, the baby is the size of a coffee bean, and around seven weeks is when the baby's heartbeat can be first detected. I love sevenweekscoffee.com because it's a delicious, gourmet, small batch, ethically sourced coffee that is delivered right to your door. And right now, if you subscribe and become a member of the Heartbeat Club at sevenweekscoffee.com, you will save 15% off your first order. You'll get a limited edition drink coffee, save lives tote. And if you use the code Lila at checkout, you will get an additional 10% off. That's 25% off your first order at sevenweekscoffee.com. Check them out today. Dr. Smith, you should do a, a we should have a relationship call in show with you because that's a great, a great piece of advice. Write down a hundred, a hundred times what you want and then doesn't match what you're doing. I, I, it's so good. Okay. There's so many new things you just said that I want to unpack because there's a lot of gems in what you said. But one thing that you said at the beginning was a comment about your father and you made this note about 85% at that time, 1920s or so of high schools, high schoolers 
uh, or you know, college grads or just young people in general, when they get married, they were virgins. And I think that's an earth shattering concept today because we are told incessantly by groups like Planned Parenthood and certainly by the sex ed at large and media that it is not only not normal to have sex, it is not only, excuse me, it is, they are told incessantly that it is not only normal to have sex before marriage, but that you should sexually experiment before marriage. And that if you don't, then you may be repressed or you may be holding on to some repressive fundamentalist beliefs about sex that will harm you. Can you break down? So, but, but according to what you just said in the past, you know, our great grandparents, they didn't have sex, many of them until they got married and abortion rates, STI rates were dramatically lower. Can you share your thoughts on this idea of you are repressed if you wait until marriage to have sex or it's not healthy or normal to wait until marriage to have sex? Sure. Um, well, there's so much to this, but I mean, the, the, the marriages of my parents' generation lasted, all right? They lasted. They rarely got divorced. And people say, well, many of them were very unhappy. I said, no, some of them were. I said, but no, not many were very unhappy. Some of the, Most of them were quite, quite happy. They were faithful to each other. They appreciated what each brought to the relationship and they raised children and they had good friends that were living the same kind of life, um, worked hard, et cetera, had a good life. Um, and and that to marry a virgin is to say, I, I am waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. I expect you to be different from anybody else I've ever met. And there are certain things I want to do only with you Right? And there's especially one thing that I want to do only with the person I'm going to be with for the rest of my life. I don't want to be thinking about some other man and that he was a better lover than you are. And I don't want you thinking that there's other women who are better partner, sexual partners than I am. This is something we have a whole lifetime to work out together. There's a lovely movie called, um, I think it's called um, A Period of Adjustment. And it's it's about a, a man who was, was in our it, it, one of the he was one of the buttons I think is the last name and Jane, a very young Jane Fonda, and he was a soldier and he, he was pretending he was very sexually experienced. They got married and but he, he just was on the honeymoon night. He was drinking and he wouldn't have anything to do with her. And it finally came out in the course of the movie that he was not uh, sexually experienced and he was very concerned that he wouldn't perform well. All right. And they have this beautiful scene at the end of the movie where they're, they're back to back uh, uh, on the bed. And he's saying something like, you know, I, I just don't, I, I haven't done this before. And she said, the point is we have a lifetime to get it right. All right. We have a lifetime to get it right. What happens with couples now is what does it mean to have a whole bunch of sexual partners before marriage? What does that mean? Most of the time you're hurt by this. All right. It doesn't last. He betrayed me. He was mean to me. He used me. Sex becomes something that is not a precious treasure. It's a kind of a bargaining chip. And it's one that you give a part of yourself away to someone and you feel you. You feel pretty rotten. And now you're taking the same body, the same person, and giving it to someone else. And you want to say, what kind of a gift am I giving you? And what kind of a gift are you giving me? You've given this to many people. Then I even talked to people who had had only had sex with each other before married, not with other partners. But not, it, maybe it's different now, but at the time they were telling me, they said, yeah, you sort of had to, you had to sneak around quite a bit. There were people you had to lie to about, well, your grandma, you didn't want to let your grandmother know you were having sex. You don't want your younger, younger siblings to know you were having sex. Maybe you're lying to your parents. You're lying to your, some of your friends. You've become a liar, right? You notice that your partner's become. He's good at lying. I'm good at lying. Wow, this is a nice characteristic I've developed, and I, I see it in my future, the person I hope to marry. They, this couple said something I thought was very important. They said, when we were having sex outside of marriage, we had to sneak around and we had to lie. And we were lying to each other about the level of our commitment, the level of our assurance of where this would go. And they said, once we got married, it was hard to put that away. It was hard to think that this was not naughty in some sense what we were doing. Sex became something that was naughty, right? 
Whereas I have other friends, I had a young friend, a young man, and his, he dated this woman for like five years. They were virgins when they got married. And I saw him after the, the wedding night about a couple weeks later, and his, his smile is up to here. And he's just going, he was a student of mine, Professor Smith, he said, everything's different now. And everything's okay. Everything's good. And so that sense that this, that everything about this relationship, no regrets, no past thoughts of, of what has happened in the past with other people is the word pure is a good word, unsullied. All right. And this person hasn't been hurt and I haven't been hurt and we're not going to hurt each other. It's a spectacular. It is a beautiful thing. I think for many people, they feel it's unrealistic because so many people have had sexual encounters. They've had sex, you know, long before maybe they're going to or they would be getting married. And I think there can be maybe some despair that people may feel that if they've had sex once, twice, three times, multiple different partners, what's a few more? What would be your take on that? I think on the show, we talk a lot about the importance of redemption and then also that, you know, you are not you, you mentioned this idea of pure being sullied. You know, the human person is beautiful and is made good and our mistakes don't define us. So if those mistakes are in our past or the, our loved ones past, that doesn't mean we can't love them or that they can't start start again. Good. You're, you take it just down the right path. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's very important. Um, we all make mistakes. All right. And we have to recover from those mistakes. Some mistakes are very big. Some mistakes are some mistakes and almost aren't on our, our fault. A lot of this sexuality stuff, our culture has done this to us. Mm -hmm. our culture. I mean, if they say that the average boy looks at pornography at the eight years old, um, how responsible for he is for having this very distorted understanding of sexuality and of what women want. Um, I, I've said some very negative things about male here, but I don't, I don't think that men are constitutionally corrupt. Um, I, I think men are by, by their nature. I think they're protectors. I think they're providers. I think by nature they're noble. But our culture tries to rob men. And instead of developing those characteristics in men, they try to turn them into predators and selfish playboys as opposed to responsible males. Uh, 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 mm -hmm. And that's the, nat that's the natural thing. That's where if I can bring God in, that's what God wants us to be, all right? And our culture is trying to make us feel foolish for that, that that we're, re as you said, we're repressed, as opposed to saying, oh, I have control over my desires, and I'm not going to, to just play around, right? But our culture pushes people into that, and there's very few people in our culture that don't succumb, right? They have ha had to have a tremendous upbringing or tremendous role models, or who knows what kept some people free from the um, corrupting influence of our culture. Of course, the Catholic Church has the um, the sacrament of confession. And we believe that if you confess to God the things that you've done wrong, he will forgive you and he will give you grace that helps you heal. Right? It's not automatic. It's not overnight. I mean, most of us, <laughs> most of the sins that we have, we have for a long time. And even if we're not doing the sins anymore, we still have the consequences of those, those if you, if you want to say bad choices, bad choices that we've made in our life. But we have to learn to make better choices, and we have to constitute our, um, our thinking about sexuality. There's a, there's a um, a video. I think it's called um, "True Love Waits." It's only twelve minutes, and it's about a young man who had been sexually active, and he saw a woman at church, and he felt. A girl, he was a young woman, fell absolutely in love with her, um, asked if he could date her. And she said, well, I just want you to know I'm not having sex. As a matter of fact, I'm not kissing until we get married, until I marry. And of course, that's that's pretty um, strict, you might say. But she had made some mistakes. She didn't want to make them again. And um, he had made a lot of mistakes, many more mistakes. But he loved her. So she gave him some books to read on the meaning and purpose of sexuality. He was sure he could wear her down. He was sure that, he, that not that she was going to sort of win this battle, but that he was going to win it. Well, he didn't. He completely, and he said it was really, really hard because he had all these appetites that had been out of control that he needed to control. But as he became to revere her and love her and think, I don't want to do any harm to this woman. 
I would never want to touch her in a way that she doesn't want to be touched. I would never put her well-being in, in danger. And so eventually they married and had mm -hmm. four or five children. And they seem to be as happy. I mean, if they're as happy as they seem, they're very happy. Um, <laughs> so you can see people. She had made mistakes. He had made mistakes. But they got their thinking right. And then they, mm -hmm. they got their behavior right. And they could put things... Now, I, I would guess both of you would probably say, I wish you had never made those mistakes to begin with. And it was hard to reconstitute ourselves and reconstitute our, our understanding. But even John Paul II uses the phrase secondary virginity. You can kind of... You can't physically become a virgin again, but you can get your whole view of sex again back into that line of... Everylife.com is America's fastest growing diaper company and America's only pro-life diaper company. These are best in class diapers that are great materials for your little one, that are leak proof, that are soft. And what I love about everylife.com is you're not only partnering with a pro-life diaper company, but they donate and give back to the pro-life movement, donating thousands of diapers to moms and babies in need. So go to everylife.com today, order your subscription. You can become a monthly subscriber so that your diapers are delivered right to your door and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. And to be clear, I think it's important here for anybody who's listening, uh, thinking about what does the Catholic church teach on this? What is the Christian view of sex on this question of virginity? If there is, and because sexual violence is so pervasive, if there is sexual violence against someone that doesn't take away their virginity. So you can't, in a sense, lose your virginity because someone assaults you. You are still in no way, you blemished, you know, morally, physically even. I mean, obviously there may be physical harm to you, but the point is uh, you're still you're still a virgin in that you never chose that. Um, I want to get back to contraception for a minute because there's so much here to talk about. And I loved what you said earlier about you know, our modern view of contraception as some sort of antidote to abortion is so backwards. And the reality is the abortion rate has increased as contraception has become more available. Walk us through some of the harms of contraception that people need to know about. Because as it stands now, you look at the GOP platform to the Democratic platform, so politically, and as it stands culturally, you're uh, you're clueless if as a woman you're not running towards birth control it's, it's clearly an amazing thing for women is the argument and we're we should be so grateful to have it and we should have unfettered access to it why is that the wrong view yeah uh, uh, many years ago i was speaking at a um a feminist conference and there was a very famous feminist there named Jermaine greer she was like a six foot tall australian who was um very imposing, brilliant woman. And she was, oh, she's very pro-abortion, um, but having second thoughts on contraception. And she said, you know, I took contraception in the 1960s. And she said, nobody really knew what it did to your body. And she said, so if I, while I'm standing here, if I should have some huge growth in my forehead, she said, don't be surprised because nobody knew it was massive doses of the same They've been reduced over the year precisely because of, of many bad physical side effects. They still have many bad physical side effects, but they're much reduced from what they were when it first came in. As a matter of fact, three women died in Puerto Rico when they were testing the contraceptive pill. And they have always tested contraceptive pills in third world countries with illiterate women because they can't sue, all right? And three women dying is cons in Puerto Rico is considered to be a negligible sort of thing. So when did Jermaine, that happen, Janet? Was... Most people, I want to pause, just bookmark that, pardon the interruption, because it's so important what you just said. Sure. The history of the trials of the contraception that we know today as it's evolved, you just said that some of these trials involved third world countries, women who were not literate, at least not in the language that they were being tested in, uh, the, the, those that were testing the drugs on them, and that some have died. Can you share more about that? Well, yeah, it's it's. Uh, I believe it's still available on the internet. Um, there was a, a documentary done by PBS on something like forty years after the pill, and they were looking at the original trials, and they were again um, hoping they would be safe. But if you tested them on American women, um, then American women were very opposed to it because they they even stormed Congress at a certain point and said these have not been properly tested, they have not been vetted. And we don't know what they're going to do to our bodies. So the, the testing that was done is it's still done in third world countries. And um, 
after the three women died, they just adjusted the dosage of, of the pill. And so it, it's worth, what, what Jermaine Greer's point was, is that she said, this was at a college, you know, these college educated people. And she said, you're all very bright. She said, you can read um, at the, the, the insert on any of the contraceptives. She said, at that time, I don't know what it is now, it was like 33 different contraindications of taking a contraceptive pill. And she said, I'll bet most of you have never read it. And she said, in your name, these drugs are being pushed in third world countries. Oh, you know, all the highly educated um, women, very professional, sophisticated women in the United States are using the pill. So it's safe for you. It's just, a, and she said, it's just a lie. She said, it, we're just not using the gifts that we've been given to, to have this education. We can go to the library. We can read the pill. Uh, she was I used to know a priest who was dealing with couples who were coming for marriage prep. And um, they'd be talking about the pill, and he'd, say, he'd give them the insert that was in the pill. He'd give it to the young man, and he said, would you read down what the, the bad side effects are? And he'd sit there and read them, and, the, and then he'd say, would you take something that has those bad side effects? And he's kind of, and she's looking at him and saying, well, if you wouldn't take it, why would you expect me um, to take it? And so, you know, we're in the United States, we're all into this notion of informed consent, and we have to take, be accountable for our choices and what we're doing. Well, this is a pill that many women take for 10, 15, 20 years, and they've never read what the pill does to them. There's a book out now that's called um, This Is Your Brain on Birth Control by mm -hmm. Sarah Gill. It's a fantastic book. She's not altogether opposed to the pill, but she wants women to know what it does. And the studies in the last 40 years on what the chemicals do in the contraceptive pill have just uh, uncovered so many things that if women don't know them, we're totally irresponsible. Um, and, and not just physical ones. The physical ones are very, even the minor ones, these are considered minor because, of course, most doctors are males. And if they don't, if you say, oh, I've, I've started getting migraines since I took the pill, they say, oh, we'll give you some medicine for your migraines. Well, no, I think it's the pill. No, I don't think so. We'll just give you some money for, for the migraines. Well, I've been gaining weight. No, 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 no. Just watch your food mark. Well, I'm, I'm depressed. Oh, I'm, I found myself very irritable. When I give my talks, I always say to women, I said, most of us want to be, um, we want to gain weight, be more irritable, be more depressed, and have less, less of an interest in sex. That's what it does too. The contraceptive pill reduces your libido. It reduces a woman's sexual desire. So she's taking a pill, supposedly, to help her to have sex, but it's making her more depressed, more irritable, gaining weight, and lowering her sexual desire, um, it doesn't make sense. I said, we have something for you. It's called the contraceptive pill. I said, most of the men in this audience, I said, would like the woman you're dealing with to be more depressed, to be more irritable, to gain <laughs> weight, less interested in having sex. We have something for you. People are not paying attention. And in this book, um, Sarah Hill gives testimony after testimony. A woman will say, I've been on a pill since I was a teenager. When I got married and 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 I, I went off and I was a different person. She said, I dealt with the world very, very differently. Well, you can imagine if you're taking a whole set of hormones day after day, week after week, year after year, that fundamentally change your physiology, right? Your sex hormones, your sex hormones, right? This is one of the many receptors we have of the world around us. And when, I mean, most of us, before you're using contraception, a lot of women can't remember who they were before they used contraception. It's been so constant, all right? But you respond to the world differently. I mean, you, you just, for instance, you have a lot of PMS. <laughs> Many of us had it or have it, all right? And you know at a certain period of the month, you're just going to be kind of ferocious and out of control. You can chart that, and you can know that's when that's going to happen, and you can prepare for that. When you're using a contraceptive pill, what happens is that it, it puts a woman in a state of pseudo pregnancy, right? It, it gives the woman the hormones that she has, uh, artificial forms or the hormones that are naturally in her body when she's pregnant, right? So she's not having a normal fertile cycle, which women should have by nature, and she's not pregnant, which is another natural state. She's in a completely unnatural state, 
I mean, she, she's putting in her body stuff she wouldn't let me put in her food or in the water supply, all right? But we put it in our bodies, again, day after day, week after week, year after year. And it so a woman is in a state of pseudo-pregnancy for that whole time. Most women, when they're pregnant, find that their sex desire goes down. Evolutionary speaking, that makes sense, all right? Um, the sexual whole sexuality that we have is directed towards mating and having children. If you're already pregnant, you have no desire to mate because you're already pregnant. And you're not thinking about having children in a sense because you're having a child. <laughs> so you're, you're already in that condition. Whereas the pseudo pregnancy and it changes your perceptions just remarkably. And the Sarah Hill goes into this extremely well where she talks about how women choose different men when they're using chemical contraceptives. This is huge. Wow. WeHeartNutrition.com is wholesome supplements with wholesome values made for women at every stage of their lives. I love WeHeart Nutrition because they are a family-owned and operated business based in the United States that has the highest standards for purity and quality for their vitamins. Did you know that most vitamin companies are owned by conglomerates that are pro-abortion? donating to and supporting groups like Planned Parenthood. Not so with We Heart Nutrition. We Heart Nutrition donates a full 10% of every sale to pregnancy resource centers and moms and babies in need. So if you take your multivitamin, if you're taking a prenatal vitamin, if you wanna take a postnatal vitamin, maybe a premenopausal or a postmenopausal vitamin, wherever you are at your stage of life, whether you're trying to conceive or you just need that everyday women's vitamin, weheartnutrition.com is for you. These vitamins use the highest quality research-backed ingredients, always in the most bioavailable form. Put in your order of vitamins for wherever you are in your state of life. This can also make a great baby shower gift as a prenatal vitamin or a great gift for someone who just had a baby as a postnatal vitamin. And use the code Lila at checkout for a full 20% off your order. So order your vitamins today from weheartnutrition.com and use the code Lila at checkout for a full 20% off your order. It's such incredible research because it has such huge ramifications for everything. And you know, being on birth control does affect how you select for a partner and that you may not be as attracted to that partner if you are no longer on birth control. I mean, there's so many ramifications of even just that point. Uh, everything you're saying is so compelling. There's a lot more research I know that Dr. Sarah Hill has uncovered and she includes in her book. I know you're referencing some of it. I am curious if someone is, you know, maybe they've read her book or maybe they've looked at all the research on the harm of birth control on the female body, not just the immediate harms, but the long-term harms, because it's also been linked to cancers and to, uh, you know, stroke, you know, Haley Bieber um, suffering stroke because of birth control. I mean, so many other things. What would be though your position to someone or what would you say to someone if they say, okay, I get the physical harm, but the reality is I'm willing to take the bet because I really don't want to get pregnant. What would be your response to that? Then really don't have sex, all right, number one, all right? Um, it, you know, it's like, I don't want to be fat. Well, then I shouldn't eat a, a gallon of ice cream. You know, the, the acts have consequences, all right? And so if, if you say, I'm not prepared for the consequences of this behavior, I shouldn't engage in it. Now, there are natural ways to control um, your fertility, right? It for it, and it, they, it tends to work only in really stable relationships, and that means within marriage. And this is called natural family planning, right? Some places now call it fertility where fertility awareness. And I actually think every girl, as she's approaching puberty, should be taught this. And honestly, I think every boy. Should. I agree. I think boys should understand how a woman's body works, and he. I've seen men, adult men, learn this, and they're fascinated. And it's like I, she becomes less of a puzzle to him, and he begins to understand more how her whole again her physiology, which affects our psychology, how that how that works. And mm -hmm. so, natural family planning is based upon it's very scientific. It's based upon and the, there are certain physical signs that a woman has that shows her where she is in her fertility cycle. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing that most women don't know this. Um, That's incredible the, to me, by the way, with all of our advances in science and technology, and even the emphasis on you know STEM for girls and education and all of this stuff, that fact that so many girls and then women go on to become women do not understand how their bodies work, do not understand the basics about fertility and their cycle. 
yeah, in, 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 in sex ed classes, um, instead of learning how the body works, they, they just learn how, what the different contraceptives are, you know, and what the sexually transmitted diseases are. Instead of saying, well, this is how your body works. Um, it's important for you to know because what you're putting in your body changes your whole body. And, and a woman is born with all the eggs she's ever going to have. It's amazing. A woman can get pregnant only for 12 hours a month. She ovulates only once a month. And the egg lives within her body for only 24 hours. And it's only 12 of those hours within those 24 hours where the egg is alive that she can get pregnant. Now, it's more complicated than that because male sperm can live in a woman's body for up to five days. So if she has sexual intercourse five days before she ovulates, she might get pregnant from that act of sexual intercourse or four days, three days, two days, one day. But even if she has sexual intercourse on the day that she ovulates, her chances are only 43%, right? And then she might get, uh, pre and then that, and so, and she can, different bodily signs indicate when that, when the, the she's entered in to those five days before it, because what keeps the male sperm alive at a woman's body is a certain kind of mucus. And that mucus carries the sperm to meet the egg. A woman can identify when her body starts to produce that mucus. And she knows that she's about five days out from um, ovulate. So she doesn't want to get pregnant. She should not, she should stop having sexual intercourse at that time. Then after she ovulates, if she doesn't get pregnant, that fertile mucus dries up because it has no more purpose. So for the rest of the month, which is generally um, 12 days, there, 12 to 14 days, there's no more, um, she cannot possibly get pregnant. The, the egg has come and the egg has gone. If there's no egg, there can be no pregnancy. There's only, you know, one day a month when that egg is fully there and can be fertilized. But she has to abstain five days before and a day or two after to make certain that everything has been calculated um, correctly. Now, that is incredibly healthy for a woman. She's putting no chemicals in her body. None of those side effects, none of those risks of stroke and cancer, et cetera. Um, abstaining is hard. There's no question about it. But it's a good thing. It's much like um, dieting <laughs> or exercising. It's hard. But women who are in relationships um, with men, and it generally means their husband, who are using NFP, natural family planning, uh, he it's harder for him usually than her. But why does he do it? He does it because he loves her. He says, I don't want to take you taking this pill. I don't want your body. I'm, your bo I love you so way more than just your sexual availability. And so I can abstain. Um, and I've heard men say, you know, they, they, it's like building a muscle. I mean, you learn different things to do. You go for walks. You paint the garage. You do something. Um, watch a movie. Uh, and you relate more in a way. Sex doesn't become the only way of spending time and being intimate with each other. And so women will revere by their husbands, mm -hmm. and women will revere their husbands. They get a special kind of guy. For him, it's not all about sex. It's all about us. It's all about having a relationship. He doesn't want to it's, put any risk. It's sad because our healthcare system, I think, often is very anti-child. So if there's high risk pregnancies or children are having multiple children or uh, excuse me. So if there's high risk pregnancies or people are having multiple children, there's this tendency in the medical system to say, well, you shouldn't have a child or you should use contraception. We just had our third child and this nurse walks in, you know, this is after the delivery uh, several hours later, and she immediately asks about her plan for contraception. And it was just incredible that that is the immediate go to of our healthcare system. It's contraception. And then often it's abortion. If there's anything wrong with the baby whatsoever, abortion is recommended or if there's a health complication. So Dr. Smith, what is natural law and why does it matter for the non-religious case for why contraception is harmful? Right. Well, I mean, natural law just simply works by saying that nature is good, right? And if you cooperate with nature, things will go well. If you violate nature, things will go badly, right? 
And we do that in many ways. We know how many hours of sleep people should get. We know how many calories people should should eat. We know all, all sort, how much exercise. We know all sorts of things. You do those things. You save your money. Put this much money aside. Do this. Show up for work on time. Put in. You do these things. Things you prosper. All right. You cheat on those things, and you're going to start suffering. All right. Things are not going to go so well. Oh, for a while it might seem good, but over a long term, you're you know like we know how much alcohol you should or shouldn't drink. Say, so, well, I, I I want more. <laughs> well, over time, the consequences are pretty severe. I don't want to take my car in for oil. I don't want to get it regularly serviced. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. Before long, that car is not going to be working very well. I I find it greatly annoying to have to water all my flowers all the time. They don't give me any relief. All right. And I love them. I love they're so beautiful. But if I stop doing it, all right. So the general principle is that nature is good. If you treat things in accord with their nature, they'll prosper and you'll prosper. So we assume that the female body and the male body are made well that it, what to, and with the environment. We don't want to dump chemicals into the environment. We assume it does terrible harm to it. Why would we dump chemicals into our body? Now, that's just talking about the body. The human being is much more complex than the body. Again, the, our body and our relationships are very much, you don't sleep, your relationships are not going to go well. Right? One reason to get enough sleep is that you're nicer to your friends and your spouse, etc., your children, etc. All right, you mess around with the chemical of your body, you're not going to make as good choices. Um, again, you, again, you're, as I said, when you change your understanding of sex, you change your understanding of human relationships, and so um, you start to use people, you start to treat people as things, as opposed to being incredibly precious entities that have free will. And if I really love a person, I want that person to prosper and I want to sacrifice mm -hmm. for that. I want to say, I want to be in your life and I want to be in your life in order to make your life better, mm -hmm. all right? I don't want to abuse you in any way. I don't want to use you. I don't want to hurt you. And of course, I don't want that done to me, all right? And so the contraception tends towards moving us in so much towards using the other person as opposed to respecting the other person and seeking what is good for the other person. Treating sex, and then, go ahead. Well, and then if you have the situation where you get pregnant, even with contraception, then you have that temptation because you didn't want to have a baby with this person anyways, there's the temptation now to not only have used this original person for sex, but now that a new life has been conceived to end the new life. So it enables the objectification, not only of the sexual partner, but this lethal objectification of a potential new life. Yeah, well, the, as you know, the huge difference between two people who are using contraception, and not all of them, not all of them, but it's it's not an unnatural tendency. If you get pregnant while you're using contraception, you get angry, all right? Get, get angry. I, I was taking... Uh, precautions and often the man will get mad at the woman you know like as if it's her fault right and you might feel better we got pregnant we didn't expect to get pregnant it kind of it's it was an accident what do we do now what do we do now and i'm going to bring god into this picture but i i again i think that god wanted the day that any, any woman got her first positive pregnancy test to be one of the very happiest days of her life and she mm -hmm. sees that test and she says whoa I'm pregnant. And she calls her husband and says, darling, we're having a baby. And they go berserk. You know, they call all their, their family and their friends and they look at names and they paint. They just, everything is different. The, the joy, the happiness, the expectation is extraordinary. It's like something has happened that ha will, has changed everything forever. Mm. All right. And in, in a marital relationship, that's generally a beautiful thing. It, but look, I mean, how many movies now? But revolve around a woman getting a positive pregnancy test and she's not married and it's a disaster it's, what do Great i do now point. i hope not do i marry him i don't i hardly know him or do i oh i love him i'd love to marry him but am i going to feel like i trapped him in the marriage right do i become a single mother well, many women do, they do a fine job, but every one of them will tell you they'd rather have a husband in their life helping them with, with, mm. with their children. So 
couples who use natural family planning who very much make a connection between a woman's fertility and sex and babies. It's a natural connection. They never forget it. Sex leads to babies. Contraception tries to take that possibility out. Sex only leads to babies if I want it to. Whereas couples who are not contracepting, they understand sex leads to babies. They NFP couples generally talk not about she got pregnant. They talk about we got pregnant. Mm. And they say we had a surprise pregnancy rather than an accidental pregnancy. Because we knew we knew it could happen. All right. It wasn't an accident. I would say it's not an accident getting pregnant through sexual intercourse. It means that something's gone right, not that something's gone wrong. And so you say, all right, somehow we miscalculated the fertility, but we knew it could lead to a baby. We're married. Let's just have a, let's just enjoy this new gift that we've got. And so, and again, it, it just solidifies a relationship as opposed to saying, we didn't want a baby. We took precautions against a baby, and now we've got a baby. All right. As opposed to saying we love each other, we know that sex leads to babies. We want to build a family together. Sometimes we're going to try to manage when that baby comes, but if it if we don't succeed, it's okay. We know what life is all about. This happens. As I said, those are natural law considerations. We're just looking at the way things are and how to live in accord with the way things are and how to get the best out of them. It's powerful stuff. And I think it is so refreshing to hear it and to live by it. I know people that have changed their lives dramatically going from sex before marriage, contraception, all of these things to a different view of the human person that I think works with nature and not against nature. And there's so much peace I've seen and fruitfulness that can come with that. So thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for all of your work on this, quite frankly, groundbreaking work over the last few decades and your willingness to speak boldly into the culture when it at times is very unpopular to do so. Where can people find your work, Dr. Smith? I have a website, janetsmith.org, and there's my talks are all over the place. Um, <laughs> one is contraception, why not? One are the myths of contraception. Um, hormones are us. There's a whole bunch of different um, why premarital sex is stupid. <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, um, you know, mince my words. So it's all over. The I place. love that. <laughs> Thank ah. you so much, Dr. Smith. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. I thought there was a lot of great gems from Dr. Smith, and we're going to be tackling this topic more in the future. So as always, you can email me if you have guest suggestions. That's at lila at gtbmedia.com, lila at gtbmedia.com. And don't forget, if you're listening on podcast app right now, make sure you're subscribed and leave us a review. Give us five stars. That helps the podcast reach more people. And if you are on YouTube watching right now, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. We have discovered that over 90% sometimes of our viewers aren't even subscribed to the channel yet. So please make sure you're subscribed and ring the notification bell so that you never miss another episode of the Lila Rose podcast. Thanks so much, guys, and we'll see you later. And a huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest Catholic network in the world, reaching millions with entertainment, news, and more. Check them out at EWTN.com.